lot of people will do a bladder catheter immediately. And uh, there is some way with the uh, model and arithmetic model. And the urethra can be damaged even if there is no pelvic bone fracture. You may to put a bladder catheter just if there is any problems or if there are any problems, go have the bladder catheter in a good way once, don't try further, it doesn't be damaged. Right. So, uh, I, I appreciate that. Dr. DeRoss, are you there? Yeah, Todd, I'm here. Uh, I, have you been able to hear these talks? Yes, I have. Did you have, uh, just generally, I want to know if you had any points you wanted to make just in general before we ask you anything specific? Specific about any of the talks you've heard about either C spine clearance of the stuff that you've heard. Uh, thanks. I, all the talks were fantastic. Thanks so much to all the presenters. I've been in the room, and um, my my biggest and one of the biggest problems we face here at our trauma center is trying to objectively clear. Clear the C spines of those children who what a normal exam should be like for uh, for a six-month-old, for example, who is in a uh, motor vehicle crash and we're worried about the C-spine. Um, but how do you tell the residents what to look for and what we're looking for? You feel their C-spine, you feel for step on tender, crying, they're excited. Um, what do you do in this age group? Do you just or can you objectively clear them clinically? Dr. Nance, do you want to uh, address that? Well, I think you can get a little bit of that to start looking at um, uh, in terms of what, what our risk factors are. Quite often, you're going to look for some abnormalities, whether they're quite dramatic uh, or, or or less so. Um, you know, I think this isn't going to be the knock one. It's going to be the kid that uh, is awake and probably screaming. And, you know, if they're awake and screaming, you may not be able to adequately examine them at that time. You may simply have to put a collar on and, and work at it later. Um, but you're going to look for, you know, their, uh, whether they want to move it as you uh, examine, whether whether with tenderness to exam or, um, you know, anything like step off. So just the, the standard clinical uh, abnormalities. And, you know, yeah. I think you would start with uh, you would start with a clinical exam, and then and then if um, you need more, you'd you'd move to imaging, which would initially be plain film, and then if you're still stuck, um, that to wait, um, and uh, if you still can't do it at that point, then we would usually be moving towards MRI. Dr. We would very uh, use the CT kids. I've seen this, Dr. Meredith. I've seen a lot of like for this, but the because <laughs> the you can argue that you did the wrong thing. So if you don't have a protocol to follow, you're very vulnerable, and then if you don't follow it, you're even more vulnerable. The doctor Nance showed us is one that a given individual, given a protocol that is doable, that you can live. The places where it's subtle and difficult, we actually do have the imaging to figure that out. So I think, I think that, that algorithm, I think your entire concepts are really valuable. Dr. Just one thing, uh, yeah. Michelle, Michelle, do you have any thoughts about vascular injuries to the kidney and whether or not you should win that? Well, well, well we, we have not a lot of experience in France about that. But uh, uh, I was very pleased to hear that in vascular injury, the problem of the vasospasm is more important. I think in children that uh, probably in adults. I remember okay with uh, 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 vasospasm and, and it was only a vasospasm and not a vascular injury. 
but we have to take care of that. And uh, probably we, we, we need to ask uh, uh, our colleagues about what are they doing during operative surgery in the vaso. Uh, Dr. K Dr. Kennedy, do you have a comment on that? I do. So I would say that it is very important to recognize if there are no uh, pulse pressure, uh, but still then you can take a little bit of time to resuscitate and rewarm staff in the operating room and you see vasospasm on an imaging study or the patient still has a diminished uh, pulse after um, uh, Fogarty embolectomy, then you can get an imaging study and look for it. What you're looking for is a long tapered uh, segment of the vessel, um, and that's a hallmark, hallmark sign of vasospasm. Uh, what we typically do will, uh, is to inject a papaverin uh, mm -hmm. antigrade down the vessel and try to relieve that spasm. Uh, the dose of papaverin is uh, per kilogram, and we'll do it, uh, I tend to dilute it by uh, half even after it's mixed and it's sort of a very potent medication for a second dose if I need it. Um, and I, I will say that um, in my view, uh, vasospasm really, if you're in the operating room, the patient has a vascular injury, you've done a reconstruction, you will see vasospasm downstream, but if you're uh, diagnosing vasospasm in the setting of uh, an initially and what I worry a little, really left no stone unturned and done imaging studies, injected papaverin, and, and uh, done a full evaluation. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. That's yeah. outstanding. Uh, um, I, there's a, a lot of discussion here about the C-spine. Uh, really, the, 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 by far the most common issue, is, as Dr. DeRoss and Nance have discussed, is the clearance of, of a pre-verbal child head give their opinion because I know that everyone has an opinion hundreds of people around the world please chime in call in let us did anyone in the panel before we move on to the next talk because we have a couple minutes does anyone have any questions or comments that they want to uh, talk, talk about before we move on uh, you know, again, again, MRI is wonderful, but again, with children and infants, we're starting to end the preverbal child. So, not to make your lives more difficult, but be aware that we are worried about radiation with CT, but we are we are worried about um, sedation um, for some of the younger children and just the difficulty in get, getting that emergently at, at night and so forth. So, um, so they're extremely sensitive. It's not as specific. Uh, so I think it's, it's a wonderful modality that we now have, but um, we still have some issues. We see abnormal signal in the ligaments. Is it truly unstable or is it just a little bit of edema? I, I want to. This is a. I want to address uh, Heather Paddock. Uh, Heather, I don't know where you're from, but I want to address that. Oh, I think it's a nationwide children's. I have heard the same thing, and I have been taught the same thing. And I'm interesting to hear. I might have been wrong all these years. That if you take the collar off and they move their head, they're usually okay. Uh, and I'm seeing a um, you know when it comes down to it really C spine injuries in children really are so rare that it's hard to say uh, for sure that that, that is uh, is the case but I think I think we've all probably seen cases of that where that set does and I think uh, you know that that's probably is generally true but boy that's seems like kind of a a bold thing to put in yeah. 
Yeah, we were going at this because I told them this is I would I feel very uncomfortable about all this other I stuff. Think, all this other stuff happens, but this is what we deal with every day that I can't get a good exam on. I don't know the best way. I know, but the reality here is you can't get frustrated just to be patient and go step by step. And I, I agree with Dr. Nance. I wouldn't just. Youngsters. Stabilize their neck, get all the rest of the stuff clear. I think we should let the C spine delay the rest of the kids' care either. Oh, let me, yeah, what are I your thoughts that, on yeah. that? All right, I mean, there, there's a lot of things happening to, to the, a lot of potential for injuries. Now, if it's the head, it, if you're still concerned about it, put some kind of. Maybe this doesn't happen in wake. The kid comes in with a C collar on. We have to clear the C spine before we go back. With this, uh, this what, what do you tell them? Tell them the neck is broken. <laughs> yeah. Put them to sleep. You can't. You can't clear it. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Yeah. All right. Put them to sleep as though the neck is broken. The yeah. neck is broken. Put them to sleep. And right. It's just a hedge. I mean, the anesthesiologist is hedging, and the reality is, you just treat them like it's broken. Yeah. And the kid needs to go to the operating room. Yeah. And that's. All right, well, this, this has been no answer. That's, there's no, no bullet here where you, you can just say it is or it isn't. To take care of the justice, do justice. More likely to paralyze you than the patient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From now on, my answer is I'm going to call Dr. Eichelberger every time I have a case. No, no, I don't want to talk to you. You've been trained. We did the <laughs> Best we could with you. <laughs> You're and done. We have to throw you away. Uh, let me let me close by. I want to thank the the faculty for joining us. Patients, people can continue to discuss this. We invite you to keep talking about this in the chat room. Go on to uh, Facebook and Twitter, and we can continue these discussions at the website. That's what this is for. This is to start the conversations, and maybe someone will shed this magical light, and we'll all know what to do. Uh, <clears throat> I want to. Thank all the faculty for, for their great talks and joining us with the panel. Uh, if the audio stays with us, we have some very invite all of you to join in with us to, to give their opinion on, on these difficult cases. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Julian, I'm sorry, Dr. Robert Keating. Dr. Keating. Hey, so Dr. Keating, uh, another person uh, who was somewhat responsible for my bad training. Uh, Dr. Keating was uh, the uh, Chief of Neurosurgery at uh, Children's National Medical Center where I did my training. He is Professor of Neurosurgery and Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery, George Washington University, Children's National Medical Center, Washington, D.C. And he is going to talk to us today on traumatic brain injury, blunt versus penetration. And Dr. Eichelberger wants to say something. My guess it's going to be a jab against you, but I don't know. Let's see. Dr. <laughs> Keating, do you have any comment on this cervical spine thing before you start. Yeah. I agree with everything that's been said so far. Obviously, it's a real challenge. Do you agree with both sides of the argument? <laughs> Pick a side. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to hedge. When in doubt, assume it's broken, and we certainly end up going to the operating room many a time with a child in a cervical collar, and it's not the end to get a better clarification from a clinical standpoint as well as radiographic. What's the story with the neck? I would agree. When in doubt, it's broken. So I, I support that 100%. All right. You're on. Okay. Well, it's certainly a pleasure and an honor. I would think save you a couple minutes, Todd, in my uh, slides. I do want to do a disclaimer. I was told to make these slides extremely simple by Dr. Eichelberger that I really present to you some of the basics and how to make decisions some of the uh, neurosurgical uh, processes that you may see. I'm also going to spend a couple couple of minutes with you to talk to you about intracranial pressure, man some discussion of some of the controversies to decompressive craniectomies and so forth. So having said that, let me just start off in, uh, I don't know if you can see the slides that I can't, but I'll talk about epidural hematomas, subdural hematomas, closed head injury, and again, uh, intracranial pressure. So for the folks out there that deal with the children and head trauma, we all know this is an extremely common cause of death. 
We know that roughly a third of the accidental deaths out there are related to head trauma, and we know that this leads to a significant number of children injured each year and up to 4,000 kids dying in the United States uh, on an annual basis. From a prognostic standpoint, the most important parameters of prognosis are the Glasgow Coma Scale at the outset, as well as the length of time to fall in commands. And generally, we look at this, and if we have anywhere um, after 12 weeks, so we're still waiting to see this as far as following commands, it's usually a poor uh, prognosis. We also look at the length of coma. Six weeks is a generally a good ballpark. If you're in coma less than six weeks, you have a reasonable outcome. If you push past 12 weeks, you're looking at the issues with cognition, behavior, and developmental, and so forth. Now, again, from a mechanism standpoint, it's either contact injury, or it's acceleration, deceleration type of injury. And with its contact, we're dealing with two type of injuries where you have direct injury beneath the site of impact, whereas if it's a contra coup injury, you're dealing with uh, the injury contralateral or opposite from the area of impact, similar to a situation and ending up with a frontal contusion. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the Glasgow Coma Scale. Everyone in this room or in all these rooms know what this means. The bottom line is when you're talking about severe head trauma, we're talking about GCS of eight or less, and that's where the ball game changes. You've heard lots of great information about the management. Again, the key point in this is if there's any question about the level of consciousness, the degree of alertness to the patient, intubate. Get protection of the ear. If there's any doubt in your mind, you're better off intubating the patient. You've heard a very spirited and excellent discussion from Dr. Nance and many others about the cervical spine. I think it's important, even in the setting of an epidural or something fairly straightforward, you never know about the neck. Always assume the neck is a problem and you need to clear it before you uh, can take the collar off. So shifting gears a little bit, epidural hematomas, relatively uncommon in infants and uh, children, but not uncommon enough. They frequently involve the middle meningeal artery, certainly in the temporal bone, but they can also involve venous structures as well. Another point to point out is that uh, these kids can actually get epidurals even after trivial head trauma. And if you're looking at slides, uh, I hope you are, um, this is something that it involves a blood clot between the covering the brain itself, the covering of the brain, which we call the dura, and the surrounding uh, tissue such as the bone. So it's in the epidural compartment. Key points here are this is a focal direct injury. This is not a diffuse total brain injury. It's a direct injury. And as a result of that, your mortality, your morbidity, and so forth are a lot less, and you end up with a 5% mortality for kids versus 40% for adults for an epidural hematoma. One other point, in all my years of seeing epidurals, I've seen a, a very few number of kids with lucid intervals. It's estimated between 10 and 15% of kids with epidural hematomas have lucid intervals, so it's not common. So what do you do with these things? What, what do you do out in the field? And again, um, you can watch them, obviously, and you can uh, certainly treat them. As far as observations concerned, if they're small, if you see the slide there, the epidural, uh, you can watch those. If the patient's neurologically intact or normal, it's certainly legitimate watching them. I would point out caution. If there's an epidural up against the sinus, the sagittal, the transverse sinus, you want to watch them as much as you can. You'd hate to open that up and end up in trouble. Epidurals can also grow and get larger, and sometimes the folks come in uh, so quickly they've got a CAT scan 10 minutes after the car accident, you may not appreciate the epidural, but uh, six hours later when they're blowing a pupil, it can be there. So certainly you need to follow up with subsequent scans. When you remove them, when there are neurological changes, deficits, of course, uh, if there's a significant shift or if there's expected edema. And I always say to our house staff and folks, if there's any question, does this child need to go to the operating room, chances are you need to be in the operating room if there's any debate. So let's talk about subdural hematomas. They're broken into uh, three types, acute, subacute, and chronic. Acute are within 24 hours, chronic are within, after three weeks. And again, from a standpoint of mechanism, this is a tearing of bridging veins between the surface of the brain and the surrounding dura. That's why it's a subdural hemorrhage. It's in the subdural compartment. It can be injury to the venous sinus, and it can certainly be injury to the cortex itself in the brain. Key point in this is subdurals are a different ball game. It's, it's, it's a diffuse, involved, Severe trauma, you're often seeing the tip of the iceberg. You're looking at just the clot. That's the least of your problems very often. It's a diffuse injury to the brain. And because of that, your outcome is obviously significantly different and much more involved. And when you look at outcome, it's dependent upon the age of the patient. The younger patients do better. It's dependent upon the neurological status at the time of presentation. Obviously, the patients that come in sick don't do as well as ones that don't come in as sick. 
the severity of injury and other associated injuries. Folks with subdurals usually or very often have other types of injuries and of course how long it takes to get to the operating room to evacuate. Now you can observe acute subdural hematomas but the very small ones. If you look at the slide you see that very small one in the back on the uh, patient's right occipital region. You can certainly observe patients are alert and awake with a normal neurological exam. And I would argue if a patient comes in with a GCS of three and there's insignificant extremists, it doesn't do anyone any good to go ahead and take a child to the operating room for a subdural. As far as um, doing something or being uh, aggressive, doing a craniotomy, significant subdurals in size, obviously shift of the brain, patients that are neurologically compromised or show a deficit. And again, in a situation where it's a borderline picture, but you're at the beginning of the trauma and you know that patient will become more involved over the next 48 to 72 hours with edema, you're best off in being uh, pro, uh, proactive. Now their outcome of the acute subdurals uh, often ends up with, uh, often end, leads to patients that are poor from a neurological perspective. They may often have seizures, development delay, hydrocephalus, and now your mortality is 60% versus the 5% that you see in epidural. Different ball game, different issue. What about chronic subdurals? And again, in the acute setting, you will see kids come in presenting acutely with chronic subdurals, lateral involvement. Uh, they can be insidious in their onset. It may not be clear cut what happened and why it happened. Seizures represent roughly half of the presentation. And when you see this, first and foremost, rule out child abuse. You can certainly observe chronic subdurals in patients that are alert and, uh, and not manifesting any signs of increased intracranial pressure. And they need to follow them with head circumference measurements and looking for delay and all that sort of thing. Standpoint with chronic subdural hematoma. Again, someone that shows neurological compromise, someone that uh, you're anticipating elevated intracranial pressure, uh, folks that have significant mass effect on dealing with that. And as expected, these folks also have considerable problems with outcome. These children can have seizures, developmental delay, spasticity. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a lifelong uh, scenario. And even in the, the setting, uh, one often has to look at subdural uh, peritoneal shunts or cystoperitoneal shunts to relieve the pressure. Just a couple of words on intracranial hematomas or contusions. Um, they are certainly more frequently found in the frontal or temporal areas because of the bone and, and the contra coup type of injuries. Uh, they may be um, associated with subdural hematomas. And then from a surgical perspective, you evacuate or deal with a, um, a contusion when it's um, surgically accessible in a relatively uh, uh, safe area and when it's become symptomatic or problematic. And I'm sure a number of you in the audience have sat and watched these patients, protecting them with anticonvulsants and trying to ride them out through the first three days of swelling. So I'm going to shift gears to the last half of the talk and spend some time on intracranial pressure. And as you know, that significant number of folks with intractable intracranial pressure are at risk for death, uh, with mortalities approaching 100% in some series. So what are the indications for monitoring the ICP? If you have an abnormal CT and your GCS is three or less, it's standard of care. I think around the world to put an ICP monitor in the patient. If you have a normal CAT scan, but you have posturing or you have systemic hypotension, it's not unreasonable to consider this. Certainly mass lesions, clots, and so forth um, with expected edema, it's reasonable to consider this. And if you're in a position where you really have to be aggressive with sedation and paralysis, it's probably not unreasonable. What are your thresholds for treatment in the setting of intracranial hypertension? We start getting worried at 20. We start considering five. And we know that because your best outcomes are seen with head trauma when your intracranial pressure is below 20 millimeters. The other part of the equation is cerebral perfusion pressure is the key element here and you need to maintain that. So your objectives for monitoring ICP are to keep your ICP obviously below 20 or below 20 to 25. Your best outcomes are associated with intracranial pressure in that normal range. And as a result, what you're trying to do with the monitoring is to reduce secondary brain injury, maintain your cerebral perfusion pressure, obviously ensure your oxygenation, and ultimately to avoid herniation. There's two different approaches to monitoring the pressure. It directly into the brain, into the parenchyma of the brain. Very accurate. They do have a tendency that one can watch this and look at the trends. The other approach is to put a catheter in the ventricle, get pressure, but more importantly, you can drain CSF, which can be a valuable adjunct in controlling intracranial pressure. So cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus the ICP. 
Do you treat the ICP or do you treat the CPP? The answer is yes, you treat them both. It's a, it's, it's a relationship that you work with. So with ICP management, you want to start simple, sedation, pain control, head elevation, 30, 45 degrees, normal thermia, hyperventilation. You want to stay on top of your sodium and your hematocrit. You want to maintain control. There's lots of ways of lowering an ICP, and I'll spend a few seconds on that shortly, and you can see on your slide, hopefully, uh, all the different approaches. You do want to avoid hyperthermia, hyponatremia, hypotension, and hypoxia. And I think that goes, stands for reason. There's lots of data, and there's a bibliography at the end of this talk that uh, outlines a lot of these papers. So how do you raise or how do you maintain your cerebral perfusion pressure? Well, it's simple math. You can always lower the ICP. You can certainly, it's important to maintain an adequate volume resuscitation, and a lot of folks sometimes forget this. You need to maintain a decent CVP. And obviously, and a number of you know this, you can use vasopressors to do that as well. So if we look at sedation and paralysis for lowering your um, ICP, it reduces your metabolism, it reduces noxious stimuli, and it prevents shivering, all very valuable adjuncts in controlling your ICP. If we look at hyperventilation, and what, uh, what, what does this do for you? Well, it's important to remember brief periods are more important or beneficial than longer periods. Keeping your PCO2 between 30 and 35, you don't want to be too aggressive in this scenario. The longer you have hyperventilation, the more aggressive you are, the more likely that you'll have vasoconstriction, which in turn may reduce your cerebral blood flow, which is not what you should. What about CSF drainage? You can use your ventricular catheter. You can consider a lumbar drain. Both are very effective. Uh, whether it's continuous or intermittent, it doesn't seem to matter, but it's another way of reducing your intracranial pressure. What about hyperosmolotherapy? Obviously, we have mannitol. We have uh, 3%. Lots of studies out there. Both adjuncts are very helpful. There are no large randomized prospective studies for one versus the other in the pediatric world, but in the adult literature, it would seem that they're both efficacious and there's no difference between one versus the other. Barbiturate coma, very uh, important, very powerful tool. Reduces your metabolism considerably up to 50%. At the same time, it can reduce your vascular tone, which obviously can lead to reductions in your blood flow. So one needs to be very careful with any hypotension. Ultimately, there's been multiple papers and studies that have demonstrated the efficacy of intracranial hypertension, but there's been no studies that have demonstrated that there's been any prophylactic benefit. Hypothermia, lots of studies out there demonstrating efficacy in the adult world. Low grade, 34 degrees centimeter for a few days can be helpful. There's not a lot in the pediatric setting. The recent Cool Kids campaign was stopped, I believe, a year and a half ago, and this was stopped because of bleeding issues. So we still don't know. The jury's still out on this. It's not clear cut if this is helpful or not in kids. And finally, uh, the rapid activities, controversial in both the adult and the pediatric world. Lots of studies out there look at both adults and kids together. Lots of studies where it's unclear. What were the indications for going to the operating room? When did they go to the operating room? What do they do? So there's a lot of data that's all over the place. At this point in time, we do not have a lot of great large number studies of kids in a prospective fashion. The bottom line is the decompressant cranium is there to reduce, is there to uh, maintain your cerebral perfusion pressure. It's there to prevent herniation. And really, when you look at the studies from Cho in 1995 and Taylor in 2001, these are really the first studies to look at this on a larger scale, just in kids, and they demonstrated that decompressive cranies, uh, no question, reduced your intracranial pressure, but it wasn't less, less clear what the outcome uh, benefit was. So who are the best candidates? Patients with a diffuse swelling, patients with refractory um, intracranial hypertension to medical therapy with ICPs greater than 30 for at least a minute, within the first 48 hours acute uh, time frame, uh, and certainly uh, folks that have evolving cerebral herniation. Still a lot of debate on what the best surgical approach, and I'm going to wrap this up with an example. It's a 13-year-old female in a car accident brought to the hospital with a GCS of 7, moving a right side bed on the left, and unfortunately the dilated right pupil. And you can see this, hopefully see the CT there. She has a large uh, acute subdural with shift. She went to the operating room for evacuation of the subdural, and an ICP monitor was placed. Post-operative, the brain looks better. From a shift standpoint, you see the monitor to the right frontal lobe, but you right occipital, parietal occipital area that's a bit worrisome. And sure enough, three, four days into this, our ICPs are starting to decline. We're having trouble managing them with medical therapy. She now goes back to the operating room for a decompressive cranny that you can see the bone missing there. 
and a large duroplasty, which was beneficial in helping her ICP. Six months, seven months later, she comes back for the bone being replaced. You can see that the brain obviously has had a considerable ischemic event, but the bottom line is it saved her life, and this girl actually had very good cognition despite being spastic. So briefly, decompressive cranies, certainly a valuable adjunct. I think the jury's still out on kids, but it's something to consider, and it should be considered early on. So to conclude, don't get confused by the individual data. It's really the whole picture that matters. You need to maintain, maintain control from the beginning. Once the patient loses the, uh, the ability to keep those numbers and the data in check, it's hard to get that back. You need to be preemptive when it comes to intracranial pressure. Uh, obviously, you need to measure to know what you're doing. You certainly need to be uh, aggressive uh, up front and watching everything to the best of your ability. And certainly don't wait till your intracranial pressure is greater than 40 to do something. If, if you've gone through your algorithm and the barbs aren't working and the hypothermia is not working, then you need to be thinking about a decompressive crany. And ultimately, the only thing that really matters is the outcome. So we may reduce the intracranial pressure, but the bottom line is how do these kids do in the long run? So I'm going to wrap it up with that. Uh, there are, there's a large extensive bibliography at the end of this. And I'm certainly available to answer any uh, questions or participate in the panels. Thank you, Dr. Keating. That was great. And uh, we were, I was trying to keep up with you on the slide, so uh, I think uh, I was a little off here and there, but I think everyone got the picture, so thank you for that talk. Can you stick around for a few minutes while Dr. Bayless gives his talk? Absolutely. Perfect. Um, Dr. Great job. Great job there. Dr. Bayless, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, Dr. Julian Bayless is the chairman of neurosurgery at Evanston Hospital, Evanston, Illinois, and he's going to talk to us about mild head injury, diagnosis, and management. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Bayless. Uh, you're welcome. Good, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, concussion, we say we know more about it now than we ever did before, and we've learned more in the last decade than we did all throughout medical science and research. So it, as most people know, it's uh, it's very topical, and it doesn't seem to be leaving the, the interests of, of society. Uh, the first slide uh, really starts talking about, you know, what is a concussion and uh, uh, what is, uh, how do you define it? Uh, are they more common? And depending on whose statistics you believe, there's up to uh, 3.8 million, nearly 4 million concussions in sports or recreation in this country alone. It's more common in youth sports, uh, nearly 9% of high school athletes, and, and the incidence appears to be increasing. Uh, football, soccer, especially girls' soccer, ice hockey, basketball, and a higher incidence than we thought previously in girl girl athletes, uh, female athletes, and the question begs: Is is there more more concussions, or just more being diagnosed? We're not sure. Uh, the best definition for a concussion really is Dr. Bayless. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. Did you want to advance your own slides? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Great, perfect, thanks. Yeah. Uh, this is this is the most current and probably uh, best uh, uh, definition. Uh, uh, it's a complex pathophysiological process affecting the brain induced by traumatic biochemical force. You know, when I was a resident years ago, we used to think that a concussion was the brain just wasn't working right, but it wasn't injured, and we know now that that's not the case. It's defined by having any sort of change in neurological function, and that can be memory or, or balance or, or vision, any number of things. And although it's called technically in, in the scheme of things mild traumatic brain injury, we don't like to use the word mild anymore. One of the uh, peculiar things about sports MTBI is that the vast majority are not knocked out, only about 10% of the time. So most of these athletes are walking and talking, and, and therefore it's often hard to discern who's had a concussion. Uh, the CAT scan and MRI typically are normal, and that's been the source of a lot of confusion uh, because a, an athlete may go into an emergency room in, at a community hospital or anywhere and be told their CAT scan is normal. The conclusion by the athlete and the family and the coach is that there couldn't have been any kind of brain injury because the CAT scan is normal, and we know that the CAT scan should be normal with concussion because there's no bleeding or fracture or anything else. The other thing is that we know now that fully 15% will have symptoms uh, lasting more than one year, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Now, we used to spend a lot of time 
I'm grading concussions. I think the trend is to get a grade one was mild and two moderate, three severe. Now we're just typically uh, trying to decide symptoms there and therefore is a concussion diagnosed and have the symptoms resolved. And if they haven't resolved and it's been a period of time more than days or a week or concussion, uh, regardless of whether they had a loss of consciousness or not. Most concussions resolve within a week. However, I list here the categories I like to use, post-concussion syndrome, lasting uh, usually up to six weeks, and uh, the patient and the family can often be reassured, uh, but sometimes up to 12 weeks, and, it, and it's self-limited. doesn't require pharmacological management, uh, doesn't require uh, 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 sleep aids or anything of that sort, uh, but but it goes away ordinarily on its own. A prolonged post-concussion syndrome is what we're seeing and hearing about more and more now. And this is the classic case would be a high school girl soccer player who who got a concussion, maybe only headed the ball, and then uh, has had symptoms which are lasting for months, and that post-concussion syndrome. That's when referral, detailed neuropsychological testing, uh, perhaps pharma pharmacological management, the four categories we use for that are uh, uh, something for sleep, a hypnotic agent for sleep, uh, something for depression, um, lack of energy, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and headache. Those are the four categories that we may in a prolonged post-concussion syndrome begin to use a pharmaceutical uh, adjunct. And then, of course, everyone's heard about this issue of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. There's been a lot in media about it in former professional football players or wrestlers. And we just reported the case of a military 27-year-old uh, uh, Iraqi war vet who committed suicide, was diagnosed prior as having PTSD, but his brain showed this changes of CTE, which is tau protein deposition. So this is the worst case scenario. It's rare, uh, but you're going to hear about it, and, and you need to know about it because that's uh, uh, what's out there and what the, the uh, long-term risk for a minority may be if they continue uh, to have repetitive TBIs, especially after having concussions. Now, concussion symptoms, most people are aware of them. Uh, confusion, headache, uh, amnesia, balance problems, hearing. Uh, we're, we're, we're finding more and more cases of inner ear disturbance, whether it's balance or hearing, um, uh, photophobia, uh, blurred vision, and sleep problems, and so forth. So these are the cause with concussions. Uh, they don't have to be there at once. They can come and go. They can be uh, of a delayed onset. But uh, th this is the part of the symptom checklist, with the, which if the player is symptomatic, they don't return to play. I mentioned just a minute ago that we used to think concussion was the brain wasn't damaged, it just wasn't working right. We know now that there is cellular injury, primarily at the mitochondrial level with utilization of glucose. Uh, we know that there's ultimately probably the risk of ATP failure, and, and then, of course, we don't want apoptosis or cell death to occur. Uh, in addition to cellular injury, there's ultrastructural injury, and that is to the, to the uh, axons and dendrites, particularly the microtubules, which provide for axonal transport. And this is an example that... that that scientific data in the last decade has contributed that axonal transport can be interrupted. And that's how the disconnection and the potential for long-term effects, if repetitive, can occur. And I don't think anymore it's, it's so much hitting your head which causes concussion. I think it's more the movement of the brain. The brain, is, as we all know, is, is um, floating in a bath of cerebral spinal fluid. It has a certain amount of uh, play there, a certain amount of movement that can occur. And it's the head motion, the rotational angular forces which uh, cause tension and tearing of, uh, of the membranes of the axons and dendrites. I think the brain uh, normally tries to 
self sealed this this injury, which I like to call mechanoporation breaches in these fibers because of mechanical energy inputs. I think the brain normally does heal that, but again, if repetitive, if a symptomatic player is allowed to return to play, and uh, multiple uh, MTBIs occur, or perhaps even subconcussive blows, uh, that's where this risk continues. And uh, you see here the, uh, the diagram showing the, the break in the membrane. Uh, we've utilized, as well as others, looking at different substances like omega-3 fatty acids, which make up these membranes, is one idea in, in looking at concussion mitigation. Uh, now, what about cumulative effects? What about uh, future risk? Well, it seems in, in our research and others that three or more identified major concussions, or another way of describing is, is that three or more concussions that, that uh, occur uh, uh, that result in loss, in time, loss of playing time is where the risks begin. And we know that with three or more concussions, each one takes longer to recover. The symptoms are more severe. This is an NCAA study published in JAMA showing in collegiate athletes three or more concussions. Uh, Kevin Gutzowitz and my, myself have done a, uh, a lot of work looking at uh, retired professional athletes. Here's a study in uh, high school athletes showing prolonged effects of concussion. Our work in uh, analyzing retired professional players showed that there is a five times greater risk of having mild cognitive impairment if they had three or more concussions during their playing career. Likewise, depression also was found to have a triple incident if there were three or more concussions. So at every level, it appears that there is kind of a threshold number. I say I don't know if it's three or two or five, but it, at least multiple groups have found that three appears to be kind of a, uh, a, a tipping point, and I would consider everyone, if an athlete has had three or more significant concussions, to consider uh, greatly the return to play uh, uh, safety. Uh, we occasionally use an MRI you see here uh, in this uh, white matter lesion which ended the career of this uh, professional football player. And you see the use of newer techniques in MRI, such as diffusion tensor imaging. And this is, this is studies that we would go to if they had a prolonged post-concussion syndrome that we wanted to document if there was a radiographic uh, documented lesion. And this helps us with management, particularly to avoid return to play. And, and often this ends in retirement for that athlete. Now, the neuropsychological testing, because uh, the fact that radiological studies are normally normal or negative, neuropsychological testing has emerged as rapidly becoming a standard of care. And, and there's a, a lot out there that uh, people can read and study about, but the computerized form that can be taken on a PC-based software and compared with either baseline of their own athlete or age-matched normative data is very important, and if you manage concussion now, you have to have a working knowledge of neuropsychological testing. All concussions are serious, uh, being, uh, changes in the culture, don't hide them, report it, take time to recover. We like to tell them it's better to miss one game than the whole season. Uh, certainly, uh, we, we hope to minimize uh, concussion by teaching safe techniques encouraging all the changes which have been made from the NFL on down in terms of avoiding head-to-head -head contact. Uh, and, uh, and you're aware that, uh, that uh, 37 states now have passed laws legislating. Uh, I'm the medical director for Pop Warner Football. We're the largest, uh, uh, we're the largest uh, nationwide youth football league. And we're looking uh, at our medical advisory committee and working with coaches at uh, changing the style of play, uh, less initiation of contact with the head, trying to avoid head-to-head -head contact, and certainly player and coach and parent education. In terms of concussion management, this is my last slide. Always remember a player should be completely asymptomatic and have a normal neurological examination. 
and if neuropsych testing be returned to or towards normal uh, before they return to play. If you have a diagnosis of a concussion that the same game or same practice that same day until it's been uh, properly reviewed, uh, sometimes symptoms become more obvious later, aren't apparent initially. Uh, those who have an abnormal neurological examination, loss of consciousness, are an abnormal CT scan need to be admitted to the hospital. I'm uh, not going back to school for, for a week or so until the symptoms resolve, avoiding alcohol, caffeine, hydration. And I mentioned the potential role of uh, omega-3 fatty acids such as DHA and other, and other uh, supplementation. Uh, so I'll conclude there and uh, 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 certainly can participate in the uh, Q&A. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Bayless, thank you so much for that. We, uh, as you might be able to see on the side, a lot of questions have come up. And uh, we're obviously behind it. We're going to try to cram in as much as we can in the next 10 minutes. But I'd first like to uh, introduce our other panelists uh, for discussion. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry Joya, are you with us today? Dr. Yes, Joya? Yes. Perfect. Dr. Joya is the Chief of Pediatric Neuropsychology uh, and uh, at Children's National Medical Center. Dr. Joya, can you give us your take on what you just heard, that talk on concussion in children? Any differences, any major similarities? Well, first of all, I think Dr. Bellis did a great job uh, just in reviewing a lot of information in a short period of time. Uh, I would add that um, there still is a lot that we don't know, particularly with younger children um, and probably with, with what some might you know, consider the non-traditional sports. Um, such as you know lacrosse and and not they're not traditional but certainly ones that possibly are less uh, available around the country uh, field hockey um, we may not consider basketball to be in you know a sport uh, that involves concussion but in fact it does it and certainly there are some concerns about girls and their um, uh, potential either greater vulnerability or difference in their response uh, time their recovery time. Uh, so I think one of the things, just to add to this, is that we are still in a very, very active stage of researching and trying to understand this injury with younger kids. Um, the other piece to add to this is that for clinicians, um, one of the things that we see in our, our work is um, the return to school issues, the return to academic issues becomes a, a significant part of what we do management-wise. Um, and has to be taken into consideration. And so Dr. Bell has mentioned the, um, the issue of both physical and cognitive rest, and that is something we're still trying to understand uh, in terms of symptom management and how and when you allow a youngster to go back to school uh, that will facilitate their recovery and not to interfere with it. So those are a few just brief comments. Uh, obviously, there's a lot happening now, and, and it's good to see the interest that's been generated. I, I thank you, and I think that that's going to generate a lot of discussion. And I, um, I'd like, I, we had a poll up, which I hope to put up again later, to try to get a mix of who's watching today. Uh, I think that we had close to 100% at least that care for children. The question is, are these uh, pediatric doctors or adult doctors? I'm curious what experience anyone has in their experience with uh, with children. Uh, I also now like to uh, introduce our next. Uh, panelist, who is Lieutenant Commander Min Park, who is in uh, San Diego, California. Dr. Park, thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Can you give us your take? I know that Dr. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Keating briefly mentioned about craniectomy. I'm curious what your thoughts are, uh, any new concepts or ideas in your view on craniectomy in these patients? Um, I think uh, Dr. Keating actually had a, a remarkable presentation kind of going over all of the, uh, the pediatric severe head injury. As far as decompressive craniectomies in kids, uh, my experience is kind of unique in the sense that uh, um, I don't generally practice pediatric neurosurgery, but while on deployment in Afghanistan, uh, unfortunately become victims of either the combat or just general uh, severe traumas. And uh, under those situations, um, you know, we have limited resources. So we were much more aggressive in terms of doing pediatric decompressive craniectomies just in terms of uh, 
getting absolute icp management um and uh and then just basically trying to get them ready for transfer or repatriation back into the local infrastructure hey, hey, dr keating did you want to make any comments about that All right. We'll go on. Um, so I, I, next, I don't know if he's with us today. Dr. Shellington, are you here? Yeah, I, I am on the line. All right, Dr. Shellington is a yes, uh, UCSD. Um, can you talk to us about what are the new concepts in management? Well, I, that's a, that's a tough Tough question to answer, actually, because I think all of our new concepts are old concepts. Like, grew. Um, you know, the 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 newest concept was what men, what Dr. Park was talking about with uh, demanding things. The larger studies are finding that there's those aren't as helpful. We're three percent normal saline, uh, and If we're talking about temperature, may not be as safe as we can talk with potential complications and needs to be used with a lot of Caution. So I think that with respect, we have more questions about that. And anyone strategy is 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 thing that's been said. I uh, head injury and shoulder. Uh, we're doing a great job of identifying these kids. We have excellent EMS and uh, uh, and well-established resuscitation protocols. Very significant, uh, as well as the other panelists. You know, uh, uh, which I also found greater than a minute. Uh, you know, we both, we, we deal with this issue of patients who periodically increase their uh, intracranial pressure because they're being manipulated or or suction, and then there's a difference between those two, and I'd be curious. Just numbers, and everybody gets excited when the pressure bumps up with a wave. Of 
and he's a critical part of this. Um, it's in Back to three percent of us, what's the right way to use one sixty? Uh, he wants to know about about the deep paralytics when sedation should do. Yeah. Well, I I I'll start with sedation uh, and use paralytics only that they add an additional uh, bit of therapeutic synergy, uh, but clearly first involvement. Dr. Shellington? No, I, I would agree with that. I, I think the paralytic should be kind of a, a, a treatment that you're forced into, not a treatment that you're voluntarily choosing because you do blunt your exam. Um, you know, I, I think that they, and I don't know that we completely understand the mechanism by which they included in the mechanism, but even they help with your ICP problem if you get there. But they're not, it's not a treatment that I would choose voluntarily or failing. Dr. Berger, you had a question for Dr. Gio. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jo uh, Joya, uh, the question is, what guidance can you give everybody when a child does have, of age, has an injury? How do you decide and, t and guide the parents as to return to activity? First thing is to have a really uh, comprehensive evaluation of this. Their symptoms, three symptoms, and to get an understanding of how sensitive those symptoms are to activity. Uh, by building that profile, you can then understand exacerbating symptoms. Uh, that may be a reflection of the child uncomfortable is. Well, the idea is to have a, a really good assessment, a balanced problem of, of symptom management, uh, allowing them to go back to school for the amount of time they can tolerate. Um, or depending on how far out they are from their insulin level physical activity you might introduce that does not pose a re-injury risk or again doesn't exacerbate your symptoms. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Park uh, with your experience uh, when you were deployed overseas, you approached the management tools that we have here on, on of uh, making our decision based on the illness scan. Um, on a couple occasions, uh, we were so just treat with CSF drainage or sedation, maybe be quick to when the uh, findings looked uh, pretty severe, we would just go straight to the OR. Um, do the decompressive craniectomy and then follow them afterwards. And you know, in our we had limited follow-up with these patients, but uh, they seem to do well in the acute stage uh, during the hospitalization in terms of getting them um, extubated and uh, yeah. getting getting yeah. Some yeah. Reasonable neurological recoveries. And I have to thank Dr. Shellington. Actually, he had a tremendous role as well when he was deployed out there as the primary pediatric intensivist. Um, I want to, I want to soon, but I have a bunch of, Dr. Bayless, are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So first of all, I want to make sure that, uh, I want to make a comment that Amy Dishman says she wants to thank you for reinforcing 
pushing, that you don't have to lose consciousness to have a concussion. This is a question from Mass General about what are people using for long-term headaches with concussion? And then after that, I have another question for you. So why don't you answer the long-term headache issue, and then I have another one for you. 